Imagine you're a mother who wants to give your only child a sibling, but when you gave birth the first time, something went wrong and you needed emergency surgery to remove your uterus. Or maybe you have a genetic condition and were born without a uterus in the first place. Maybe you're a transgender woman. Imagine you're a professional ballerina and you want to have a child, but if you took time off to be pregnant now, you might destroy your career and never be able to provide for your future family the way you want. Or maybe you take medication that's known to be harmful to a fetus, or there's another reason why it would be unsafe for you to be pregnant. Imagine you're a gay man in a relationship without a uterus between you. You want to start a family, but surrogacy is either undesirable or simply not available to you. Or maybe you're a single man who wants to become a father but doesn't have a partner to gestate. Finally, imagine you're already 20 weeks pregnant, and this is an unwanted pregnancy, but you're morally opposed to abortion. You wish you could terminate the pregnancy without also killing the fetus. Or maybe it's a desperately wanted pregnancy, but the baby's coming now, too young to survive. So what is ectogenesis? By its broadest definition, ectogenesis refers to the creation of life outside of the womb. This emerging reproductive biotechnology has many names, including the artificial womb, artificial amniotic and placental technologies, etc., depending on how much of the gestational period is taken over by technology. Partial ectogenesis is already possible through IVF and neonatal incubation while full ectogenesis, from conception to delivery, currently only exists in our scientific imagination. However, even just the idea of ectogenesis causes us to radically reevaluate our assumptions about human reproduction and the distribution of burdens and benefits when it comes to human gestation. So how would it work? Scientists generally believe there are three technical obstacles we need to overcome to achieve artificial gestation. The first is the need to create a three-dimensional shell for implantation and gestation to occur. There are various prototypes and different designs being trialed around the world. We've had tank-like models with arteriovenous pump systems used in animal trials since the 1990s and we now have fluid-filled biobags being trialled in the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and Tohoku University in Japan, to name a few. In the future, it may even be possible to 3D print an organic shell. Here we have an artist impression of an artificial womb, and this is from the Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. We can see pictured here one of their chief scientists, Professor Ui, this design has been made to mimic the appearance of the organic womb as much as possible. Our second challenge is a replacement for amniotic fluid. And this is an obstacle we've already overcome through the use of synthetic substitutes. But the third technical obstacle is by far the most challenging, providing nutrients and oxygen to the developing fetus. In other words, finding a system to replace the placenta. We have a variety of different models being discussed, including miniaturized oxygenators and extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, or ECMO. And here we can see a representation of the ex vivo uterine environment platform. And this is from the Women and Infants Research Foundation in Western Australia. Here we have a biobag system and a pump, which is providing all of the nutrients required. For these animal trials, we had lamb fetuses transplanted from an organic womb into the artificial womb to continue its development. One of the major challenges in converting this technology for use with human premature infants is developing a system to reliably transfer the fetus from the organic womb into our artificial womb without it attempting to breathe, 
because its lungs are not ready for that. So here we have some scientists working on exactly that issue. Again, this is Antoven University of Technology, and they're proposing a fluid-filled biobag that can be connected to a wound spreader used in a cesarean section. So we see here a premature fetus being transplanted across while remaining encased in fluid. But these innovations also demonstrate why partial ectogenesis is not a suitable replacement for the majority of abortions that occur, because these are done early in development using medication. As the models are currently saying, we would need major abdominal surgery to achieve this transfer. It would not be an ethical substitute for these medical abortions. And this would continue to be the case even if we developed a way to facilitate this process through the birth canal. Nevertheless, it would represent a much needed third option for people who are already pregnant, are opposed to abortion, but still want to terminate the pregnancy while retaining the ability to adopt out the resultant infant later. So why develop particularly this partial ectogenesis? The immediate beneficiaries are going to be fetuses otherwise at risk of premature birth. Our current air-based models of neonatal incubation require that the fetus has already undergone the transition to its neonatal physiology. In other words, that it is taking its oxygen from the external environment instead of from the placenta. But if we can keep the fetus in a fluid-filled environment, we can give it more time to develop its lungs, and therefore, we can dramatically increase survival rates at the cusp of viability. So where do we go from here? The more speculative elements of this technology include full exogenesis from conception to delivery. And it's important to note here that most of the scientists working in this area are not interested in full ectogenesis. They are exclusively interested in saving premature infants. However, the possibility does yield a lot of interesting questions for us to think about. How might it work? We know from IVF studies that we can keep an embryo alive in a petri dish for a number of days, and legal restrictions often limit that to 14 days. This didn't used to be much of an impediment because the science wasn't advanced enough to push it any further anyway. However, this is rapidly changing. We also know from ectopic pregnancies that an embryo can implant and start to grow in any blood-rich tissue. While this represents a medical emergency if it happens inside of a person, it is a property we could potentially exploit for full ectogenesis. We have no data on how an embryo might cope being put in an artificial womb for its entire gestational period. But if we keep extending IVF and neonatal incubation, we may eventually close this gap. The big question, why would we want to? Full ectogenesis would provide more options for those who would otherwise bear the burden of gestation. And those burdens are social, economic, physiological, and psychological. It could also yield a number of benefits for fetuses by providing an environment where we can optimize oxygenation, temperature, and nutrition, while also protecting against toxic exposures, diseases, and the effects of dietary deficiencies. So why may we not want to develop this technology? While it could make a fundamental contribution to sexual equality in reproduction, it also has the risk of exacerbating existing inequalities between people. For example, if this technology became only available to the wealthy, we would find the socioeconomically disadvantaged suffering poorer ma maternal health outcomes. In terms of fetuses, there's also a lot of risks that we don't know yet that we need to explore. One of the main obstacles to achieving this reality are negative views about this technology. In science fiction and fantasy, for example, the artificial womb is often conflated with genetic engineering, cloning, and the creation of monsters. It's a horror trope. In these futuristic tales, we often see we have lightsabers and tricorders. We can do brain surgery with the flick of a switch. But pregnant people are still screaming and dying in childbirth. It's as if we can't even imagine another way. 
But before we can convert a positive vision of this technology into reality, we need to ask ourselves some really hard questions, particularly regarding what role do we want technology to play in society and our conception of family. When it comes to ectogenesis, we need to ask, do we want this technology? If so, who should have access to it? Who should pay? And what kind of limits do we think are reasonable when we are looking at why we want to use this technology? When we ask these questions, we need to pay attention to issues of equity and diversity and the different experiences people have when it comes to family. We don't know when, if ever, the artificial womb will be perfected, but now is the time to ask these questions regarding the implications of this technology for society. As research into ectogenesis continues, you can be for or against this technology, but we cannot afford to ignore this technology. Thank you. Thank you.